Hello and welcome to our semiconductor video. You might have heard an astonishing fact the smartphone in your pocket could have powered the Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969. While this may seem far-fetched, it's true a modern smartphone is vastly more capable than the computers NASA used to navigate to the moon. But how is such immense power packed into a device small enough to fit in your pocket? The answer lies in the revolutionary impact of semiconductors. Carl Braun made a groundbreaking discovery in 1874 when he observed the first semiconductor diode effect, noting that current could only flow in one direction at the junction between a metal point and a galena crystal. Fast forward to 1901, the first semiconductor device, known as the cat's whisker detector, was officially patented, paving the way for the compact, powerful technologies we rely on today. Now, imagine a world without semiconductors. In this hypothetical scenario, devices like your smartphone or PC, which you might be using to watch this video, would be as massive as a three-story building. To put this into perspective, consider the iPhone 12. This device, which fits conveniently in your pocket, boasts an impressive computing power capable of managing a staggering 11 trillion floating points per second, or flops for short, which is a benchmark for processing power. In stark contrast, the most advanced supercomputer of the 1980s, the Cray-2, could only manage a mere 1.9 billion flops. To match the iPhone 12's capabilities, approximately 5,800 Cray-2 supercomputers would be required. This means that our iPhone is nearly 5,800 times more powerful than the Cray-2 supercomputer. The Cray-2 was about 1.2 meters tall, had a 1.68 meter diameter, and weighed 2,495 kilograms. Now, imagine that massive Cray-2, but scaled up 5,800 times. Such a computer behemoth would weigh as much as 13,750 tons and require about 7,432 square meters of space, equivalent to a large office building. In comparison, a typical computer from the late 1990s equipped with an Intel Pentium 3 CPU could process up to 500 million flops at its peak performance. To achieve the same computational power as a single iPhone 12, you would need 22,000 Pentium 3 computers. Imagine filling a large sports stadium with people, each person sitting in a seat representing one Pentium 3 computer, to grasp the massive volume of hardware required. This becomes even more mind-blowing when you realize that NASA's guidance computer for the Apollo 11 moon landing was only capable of 12,250 flops, which means the iPhone is 900 million times more potent. Semiconductors have truly transformed our lives, making technology smaller, faster, and more accessible. Silicon, with its unique properties, enables these devices to perform billions of operations simultaneously. To fully appreciate this, one must understand the physics behind semiconductors and the role of silicon within them. Now, let's take you deep inside a semiconductor to understand how such immense power can be packed into a small chipset. The importance of silicon was discovered in the early 19th century, when the study of semiconductor materials began. But what exactly are semiconductor materials? Here we are showing a portion of the periodic table relevant to semiconductors. The element semiconductors, those composed of a single species of atoms, such as silicon and germanium, are found in group 4. To the left of this column is group 3, which includes trivalent elements, atoms with three electrons in their outermost shell. On the opposite side, we find group 5, comprising pentavalent elements, atoms with five electrons in their outermost shell. In the early 1950s, germanium was the primary material used in semiconductors. However, since the early 1960s, silicon has been the preferred substitute due to its superior properties at room temperature. Additionally, silicon in the form of silica and silicates makes up 25% of the Earth's crust and is second only to oxygen in abundance. In this video, we will focus specifically on boron from group 3, silicon from group 4, and phosphorus from group 5. Let's look at the atomic structure of these elements. Silicon is a chemical element with the atomic number 14 and has four electrons in its outermost shell. Phosphorus with the atomic number 15 has five electrons in its outermost shell and boron with the atomic number five has three electrons in its outermost shell. Silicon is a classic semiconductor. 
Its conductivity lies between that of conductors and insulators. Conductors, such as copper, are materials that allow electrons to flow freely across their surfaces, facilitating electrical conduction. In contrast, insulators, like rubber, resist the flow of electrons, thereby inhibiting electrical conduction. Unlike these materials, silicon in its pure form behaves differently due to its unique atomic structure. In a pure state, silicon atoms share four electrons with adjacent silicon atoms, forming a stable lattice that leaves no free electrons available for electrical conduction. This state represents an intrinsic or pure semiconductor. However, semiconductor devices made solely from pure silicon would not possess the necessary properties for practical device fabrication. Therefore, to create an extrinsic semiconductor suitable for electronic applications such as diodes and transistors, it is necessary to introduce impurities into the silicon lattice. This is achieved through a critical semiconductor fabrication process known as doping. Doping involves adding specific impurities to pure semiconductors to modify their electrical properties. For instance, when silicon is doped with boron, a trivalent impurity, it forms three covalent bonds within the silicon structure and leaves a hole, leading to the formation of a p-type semiconductor or positive semiconductor. These p-type impurities, called acceptors, create positive charge carriers by the absence of the electrons. On the other hand, doping with phosphorus, a pentavalent impurity, forms four covalent bonds and adds extra electrons n-type doping, thus releasing free electrons into the semiconductor and creating n-type semiconductor. N-type semiconductors, referred to as donors, enhance conductivity by providing additional free electron. These modifications enable the creation of PN junctions, which are fundamental for devices such as diodes and transistors, crucial for electronic applications like amplifying signals or switching. This controlled addition of impurities tailors the electrical properties of silicon, enabling the development of highly sophisticated electronic devices, such as integrated circuits, or ICs. To understand the function of a semiconductor in a device, we will use a simpler example, such as a PN junction like a diode instead of an integrated circuit ICs, which is more complex to explain here. First, if we have P-type and N-type semiconductors without a junction, the P-type material contains a high concentration of holes, while the N-type material contains a high concentration of free electrons. Let's explore what happens when P-type and N-type materials come together to form a junction, as illustrated in this animation. Normally, without any external power source, there's no current flow, and the Fermi level is uniform throughout the structure. The Fermi level, a crucial concept in semiconductor physics, indicates the energy level at which there is a 50% chance of finding an electron under absolute zero conditions. To further illustrate this, here we depict the Fermi level across different materials, metals, semiconductors, and insulators. Each material is represented by a vertical energy line with two rectangular sections, one for the conduction band and the other for the valence band. In metals, the valence band overlaps with the conduction band, which places the Fermi level within the conduction band indicating high electron availability. This overlap allows electrons to freely participate in electrical conduction. In intrinsic semiconductors and insulators, the Fermi level precisely lies in the middle of the energy gap between the conduction and valence bands at absolute zero. This gap is narrower in semiconductors than in insulators, where the distance between the bands is significantly greater, underscoring their low electron availability and distinct electrical properties. As a result, at room temperature, insulators do not conduct electricity, while semiconductors can conduct under certain conditions. Now, let's take a closer look at the microstructural details of a PN junction diode to understand precisely how it functions at the microscopic level. First, let's focus on the junction area, where we observe interesting phenomena resulting from the different concentrations of carriers, electrons, and holes in the materials. The electrons, which are negatively charged, move from the n-type, where there are many, to the p-type, where there are fewer. Similarly, holes, which are positively charged, move from the p-type to the n-type. When these electrons and holes meet, they cancel each other out, creating what's known as a depletion layer, an area depleted of any charge carriers. When we connect this p-n junction to a battery with the positive terminal attached to the p-type and the negative terminal to the n-type, this setup is known as forward bias. 
In forward bias, the width of the depletion layer at the junction decreased, making it easier for electrons to move from the n-type to the p-type side. Here in the animation, we demonstrate how this reduced barrier enhances carrier movement, leading to increased electron diffusion from the n-side to the p-side. This process results in minority carrier injection at the edge of the depletion region. As these carriers diffuse away from the junction, they eventually recombine with majority carriers supplied from the external circuit, creating a net current flow through the device. This increased flow of carriers under forward bias conditions is key to the diode's ability to conduct electricity in one direction. However, if the PN junction diode is connected in reverse bias, with the negative terminal, the battery connected to the P-type, and the positive terminal to the N-type, the dynamic changes significantly. In this setup, the holes in the P-type are attracted towards the negative charge, and the electrons in the N-type are drawn towards the positive charge. This movement causes the depletion layer at the junction to widen, effectively blocking the flow of electric current in the opposite direction. As a result, the diode does not conduct electricity when reverse biased, demonstrating its function as a two-electrode semiconductor device that allows current to flow in only one direction. In this video, we covered only the main topics of a diode to demonstrate the application of semiconductors in real life. However, there are additional details and definitions that need to be explored and covered, including the function of transistors, in a separate video. We hope you enjoyed this video. Please stay tuned for more by subscribing to our channel. Goodbye.